I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. He's looking at you, kid. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Oh, I've been thinking. Well, what do you want to do that for? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Welcome to 99 Years 100 Films, the podcast where we look at every winner of the Best Picture Academy Award in release order and see why the film is so highly regarded. This time we are looking at Midnight Cowboy. And by we, I mean myself, Blaine Dowler, and my ever-present co-host, Trey Hooks. How you doing, Trey? Good, Blaine. How are you? I'm doing well. All right, so Midnight Cowboy. This was released on May 25th, 1969. Directed by John Schlesinger, with a screenplay by Waldo Salt, based on a novel of the same name by James Leo Hurley. So it stars Dustin Hoffman, John Voigt, Brenda Vaccaro, John McGiver, Ruth White, Sylvia Miles, and Barnard Hughes. Although I would say, even though that is the official listed order, that is swayed somewhat by how people had their careers established at this point, because I would think if it was all a bunch of people at the same level, you know, equally unknown or whatnot, John Voigt would have had top billing rather than Dustin Hoffman. Would you agree? Oh, I would definitely agree. All right. So the plot synopsis, again, thanks to the kind people who edit Wikipedia. Joe Buck, a young Texan working as a dishwasher, quits his job and heads to New York City to become a male prostitute. Initially unsuccessful, he manages to bed a middle-aged woman, Cass, in her posh Park Avenue apartment. The encounter ends badly as he gives her money after she is insulted when he requests payment and it is loosely implied that she is a high-class prostitute herself. Joe meets Enrico Salvatore Razzo Rizzo, a con man with a limp who takes $20 from him for ostensibly introducing him to a pimp. After discovering that the man is an unhinged religious fanatic, Joe flees in pursuit of Ratso but cannot find him. Joe spends his days wandering the city and sitting in his hotel room. Soon broke, he is locked out of his hotel room and his belongings are impounded. Joe tries to make money by receiving oral sex from a young man in the movie theater, but learns after the act that the young man has no money. Joe threatens him and asks for his watch, but eventually lets him go unharmed. The next day, Joe spots Ratso and angrily shakes him down. Ratso offers to share the apartment in a condemned building where he is squatting. Joe reluctantly accepts his offer, and they begin a business relationship as hustlers. As they develop a bond, Ratso's health grows steadily worse. In a flashback, Joe's grandmother raises him after his mother abandons him. He also has a tragic relationship with Annie. The film has successive flashbacks to an experience in which he and Annie were jumped while naked in a parked car and raped by a gang of cowboys. The rape affects Annie's mental stability to the point that she becomes insane and is driven away in the back of what appears to be a van taking her to a psychiatric institution. The viewer gains more information about the experience as the flashbacks accumulate. Ratso tells Joe his father was an illiterate Italian immigrant shoeshiner whose job led to a bad back and lung damage from long-term exposure to shoe polish. Ratso learned shoe shining from his father, but considers it degrading and generally refuses to do it, although he does shine Joe's cowboy boots to help him attract clients. Ratso harbors hopes of moving to Miami, shown in daydreams in which he and Joe frolic carefree on a beach and are surrounded by dozens of adoring middle-aged women. A Warhol-like filmmaker and an outgoing female artist approach Joe in a diner, taking his Polaroid photograph and handing him an invite to a Warhol-esque art event which also incorporates some of the Warhol superstars, including Viva, Isabel Colin Dufresne, a.k.a. Ultraviolet, Taylor Mead, Joe D'Alessandro, and the Warhol-related filmmaker Paul Morrissey. Joe and Ratso attend, but Ratso's poor health and hygiene attract unwanted attention from several guests. Joe mistakes a joint for a cigarette and starts to hallucinate after taking several puffs, along with uppers he is offered. He leaves the party with Shirley, a socialite who agrees to pay him $20 for spending the night, but Joe cannot perform sexually. They play scrimmage together, and the resulting wordplay leads Shirley to suggest that Joe may be gay. Suddenly, he is able to perform. The next morning, she sets up her female friend as Joe's next client, and it appears that his career is finally taking off. When Joe returns home, Ratso is bedridden and feverish. He refuses medical help and begs Joe to put him on a bus to Florida. 
Desperate, Joe picks up a man in an amusement arcade and robs him during a violent encounter in the man's hotel room where Joe brutally beats the man. It is implied that Joe may have killed the man. Joe buys bus tickets with the money he robbed from the man so he and Ratso can board a bus to Florida. During the trip, Ratso's health deteriorates further as he becomes incontinent and sweat-drenched. At a rest stop, Joe buys new clothing for Ratso and himself and discards his cowboy outfit. On the bus, Joe muses that there must be easier ways to earn a living than hustling, and tells Ratso he plans to get a regular job in Florida. When Ratso fails to respond, Joe realizes that he has died. The driver tells Joe that there is nothing to do but continue to Miami and asks Joe to close Ratso's eyelids. Joe, with tears welling in his eyes, sits with his arm around his dead friend, alone. So that is the Wikipedia synopsis. The one comment that stands out to me is where they say it's implied that Joe may have killed the man. I didn't read ambiguity there. I read the film as saying Joe killed the man and didn't right. think there was room for dispute. I don't know if that was how you read it as well. I did as well. And it it's worth calling out just so the driver doesn't seem like completely inhumane. I think there's a throwaway line that they were maybe an hour, hour and a half away from Miami when he realizes that Ritzo has died. So it's not like they're in Georgia and the driver says we just have to drive on or anything unrealistic like that. Yeah, he the driver downplayed it and told the other passengers that, oh, he was just sick. But yeah, the the point there was that we can't do anything until we hit the next major city, which happens to be Miami. Right. So that's how close they made it. Yeah, they also mention when they, they they talk about how, you know, Ratso or Rico was a con man with a limp. Yeah, they did have, the, in the flashbacks, the limp was gone, he was running, so there was that, that fantasy element there, which was interesting, because we never really understood why the limp was there. Although apparently Dustin Hoffman was so insistent on keeping the limp consistent that he actually put rocks in his shoe during filming so that he would have the, the same sort of pain and the same limp all the time. And, and Rico's health worsens during the film, but from the moment you see him, he's in poor health. Yeah, he... And that's part of the reason he's called Ratso, I think, besides being a con man. But yeah, he was always what they considered unsavory. The limp is there from the start. The coughing was there from the start. So it, it's not a rapid onset. It is a slow deterioration of someone who was never in the best of shape. I know we're in this transitory period in film and in pop culture by and large. We've seen films that take place in the slums or the Bowery, but they've always had kind of a sheen to them. Is this kind of the start of New York as kind of an urban nightmare? I mean, we'd even see it played up from, this is 69, it, you'd even start seeing it seep into, like, you know, the Marvel comics of the 70s. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple elements to that. I think that, yes, this is where that starts happening in films that are taken seriously from an artistic perspective. There's some films that start treating New York more as a nightmare setting, but we're talking, you know, cheap horror films and film right. noir from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, where just Earth is a nightmare and the human experience is a nightmare and it just happens to be in New York. I think this is one of the first that says New York is different in that treatment. And on the Marvel comics, I think part of that is because this is where the crime levels in Times Square really started to build, and the Marvel offices in 1970 were overlooking Times Square. So it's literally the New York they saw outside the window and what they were living through when they went to work every day. So that probably influenced that, at least those who worked in the offices. Well, there's this great scene when Joe gets to New York, and of course they're playing up his hillbilly naivete, but like someone drops right on the sidewalk and everybody else keeps going. Yeah. And just one other comic comment on his way out there. He sees a kid reading uh, a very controversial issue of Wonder Woman that would have been fairly yes. new when this came out. 
I say controversial because the the goal of the creative team was to show that Diana is not amazing because of her because of her powers, but that she is simply an amazing and wonderful woman. So they depowered her and remodeled her on Emma Peel for, from the Avengers, and that didn't go over well with some of the writers of feminine magazines because Wonder Woman was also at the time pretty much the only superpowered female character that DC had. And to Denny O'Neill's credit as the writer, you know, he has been very open. This was the goal. We weren't trying to slight her. We were trying to, to show her strengths and we messed up. So he has accepted the criticism of the feminist experts and saying, okay, that was a misstep. Sorry. Yeah. It, th- there were other super heroines, but with few exceptions, they were all the female version of, and Wonder Woman was never the female version of someone else. Yeah, and she was probably the only female DC superhero that could be identified by people who didn't read comics. So, you know, just a little aside that caught my eye. I definitely agree with what you said earlier about the billing and John Voight as Joe Buck. This is Joe's story. And he's in it from, he's the only one who's in it from beginning to end. Yeah, it's that limited omniscient. So, you know, we, we know what Joe thinks. Sometimes we know what Ratso thinks. But every scene has Joe's exposure to the world. Right? We don't see what's happening with Ratso when Joe is not there. We don't see what's happening with anyone when Joe is not there. So this is his life. There are other people whose careers launched. This launched John Voight's career. And because he was such a nobody, but he wanted it so badly, he agreed to work for scale, which in acting terms, he was basically saying, I want to do this so badly, pay me minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And there's others that I was quite surprised were in it, especially for how short the roles are. Particularly John MacGyver. When I saw he was credited, I thought he was going to be a major supporting player. He has had a significant career. We've discussed him before, but he's got what, maybe five minutes of screen time tops as the religious fanatic. Well, and the same with Bob Balaban. He's one of those, that guys, <laughs> but you know, he, he has, you know, a roughly five, 10, 10 minute scene as the guy who picks up Joe in the, movie theater has oral sex and then can't pay. Yes, and we would know him as the uh, NBC exec from Seinfeld for a lot of us. But yeah, there's a number of people. So that was one where I think the career was launching it. And like I said, it's John MacGyver where I was surprised he was coming in. Dustin Hoffman was not going to be considered for the part because it was so different from the other roles he had played that the producers didn't think audiences would accept him. So he said, no, I can do this. I can belong on the streets of New York and convinced one of the producers to meet him on a street corner in New York. And the producer hung out there and was waiting 10 minutes for Hoffman to show up. I thought Hoffman was late. And no, it turns out that Hoffman was the panhandler that had been there the entire time that had blended in right in front of him. And he identified himself and that's the main thing that helped him get the role. Probably also worth noting that Brenda Vaccaro was surely the client who finally got the ball rolling for Joe at the end. And Bernard Hughes, the man Joe kills to get the money for the bus tickets. The the role that immediately jumps to mind for me is the grandfather from uh, The Lost Boys. Yeah, his IMDb best known for have Grandpa from Lost Boys first. But then he's also Dr. Walter Gibbs and Dumont in Tron, Father Maurice in Sister Act 2, and Dr. Hogue from Doc Hollywood. So 106 acting credits to his name. Running until he was 84 years old, he passed away at age 90. What did you think of Dustin Hoffman's portrayal in this? I, I didn't think it was quite caricature, but it was. it, it did feel like one of those transformative performances and what i mean by that is a lot of times you see actors acting and they're giving a very naturalistic performance so like they're projecting somebody with different life experiences but they are essentially playing 
or you have the sense that they're playing the same type of person as themselves. Yeah, like a, a David Paymer typically plays the same type of character, and you get the feel that it's not that far off from who he really is. Right. And here, <clears throat> you mentioned the limp, but it's not just the the limp. There's a way that Hoffman's contorting his body. He He's changed his voice for the role. I feel like he put a lot more into Rizzo than the standard actor would at the time. I would agree with that. The only part that actually seemed to deviate from the character he created was the scene. It's actually one of the most regarded quotes in Hollywood, according to the AFI list, where he says, hey, I'm walking here and hits the cab when the cab almost runs him down. And I was looking up to see if, you know, had the cab broken through the set, was that not planned? Because that's where the voice breaks, and he doesn't use Rizzo or Ratzo's voice or Rizzo's voice. He uses his own voice for saying, I'm walking here. And that threw me off. I wondered, are we going to find out the whole thing was a facade? But it never happened. But yeah, so, uh, but aside from that, what, maybe two seconds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is a, a different person. So I, when we get to the nominations and awards, he will be mentioned and deservedly so. So was this your first viewing of the movie? It was. So what were your general thoughts? I think I liked it overall. I was most intrigued by the hinted backstory of of Joe Buck. The the brief snatches that we get in flashback and there there were a couple of times when I wasn't when I didn't know if this was memory or hallucination for Joe. Like for example when he's on the bus and they and you see the water tower with, you know, like Annie loves Joe forever or whatever on it. I, I wasn't quite sure if that was like really present in the real world or if he was remembering something. I found it to be a little bit of a difficult film, not in subject matter, but it was so filthy. And again, I'm not talking about subject matter. Just the portrayal of the breakdown of Ratso and the squalor that they were in almost made me physically ill while I was watching it. So from that perspective, it was a little bit of a difficult film for me. Yeah, I get dirty is an appropriate description, but that dirty or the filthy, yeah, it's not filthy content it's just there's dirt on everything so it, it's in the literal sense so this was also my first exposure and i found it, it wasn't an easy watch because it's not a happy story so we're talking about how everything is filthy that is completely appropriate to the story so this is one of those movies that i have a tremendous amount of respect for it is a very good movie but it's not one i could pop in and watch on a regular basis. I have to be sort of in the right headspace for the rewatch, knowing what I'm going to get into. Because these are people who are seeing the unpleasant side of human nature, and they don't have the happiest lives. Like they, you know, I, I wonder, you know, why would someone aspire to be a male prostitute? It, I mean, these days, be sex worker. And there are movements to try and destigmatize the job. And deservedly so, because there are stigmas in it. You th often think it's career people get into out of desperation because they don't think they could do anything else. So I was hoping that they would explore why this was his choice. And I think the flashbacks with Annie, I don't think it was explicit, but at least the way I filled it in was that was the love of his life. And he still has cravings that need to be satisfied, but he does not intend to attempt another serious relationship after his genuine love for Annie and how badly that ended. So this was a way to deal with that. Well, and maybe the line is blurred 
when I, my first initial read was not that he wanted to be a prostitute, but that he wanted to be a gigolo. And that because of the relationships that his grandmother had, that that was his projection of what a successful male role model was along with how she along with how she treated him uh, not that they're not that it changes the story dramatically <laughs> you know it is this is definitely a film about broken manipulative people who are the worst players in the game maybe you could do this same story like in the world of gambling. You know what I mean? I'm going to be the best poker player in the world, and I just get, you know, I, I just get completely ruined as soon as I get to Vegas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but here, it, here it's sex instead of gambling. Yeah, yeah that, that could be it. It could have been more, you know, Celeste pick up some new woman every week and more attach himself on almost like the opposite or the gender swap of the sugar daddy kind of thing. Yeah. This, as Trey mentioned, coming off of last month, last month was the first G rated winner. And at least at the time of this recording, the only G rated winner of the best picture award on the flip side, this is the first and currently only X rated winner of the Academy award. Now the X rating has since been retired and replaced with NC 17 because it was originally proposed as just, this is a movie that should not be seen by those under 18, and then was soon sort of commandeered by the pornographic industry, so people thought, well, that X meant nothing but explicit sexual acts, and that's why it was for adults only, especially with the double and triple X marketing, which were never actual ratings. So now it's been supplanted by NC-17 in the MPAA. Uh, here in Canada, it's a little bit different. The ratings are comparable interpretations, but instead of G, PG, PG-13, R, and NC-17, we have G, PG, 14A, meaning anyone under 14 needs an adult, 18A, so anyone under 18 needs an adult, and R is the equivalent of NC-17, where it's just, if you're under 18, you're not getting in. So. I, it, from what I'm finding, the reason that this was originally rated X rather than R was because of the homosexual mm -hmm. relationships involved. And people were concerned that it would have an influence on youngsters and cause them to choose a homosexual lifestyle. So it was re-rated as an R when it came out again in 1971. So it was X at the time it won the award. But it didn't keep that X rating for a while, or for very long. So that brings a question I wanted to ask. Joe, at least, my read is bisexual. He doesn't come across to me as having any particular hang-ups about the sexual relationships he has with men, other than when it's kind of, other than when being gay is used kind of as an attack on his manhood. I, I've seen a lot of film criticism read a homosexual relationship between Rico and Joe. Did you pick that up? Because I did not. I did not. And if anything, again, I was thinking if they remade this today, I don't think... Ratso would be throwing around the word gay as a slur nearly as often as he is here. So the attitudes towards homosexuality in the filmmaking industry have definitely changed since this movie came out. So, yeah, I didn't get anything off this that says they were in a homosexual relationship. It's just I got that these were two people who were living in a city and nobody else was accepting them for who they were. So they became very close friends, more because of proximity and acceptance than because they actually had a whole lot in common. Did the party scene do much for you? There was some parts of it. It, it again showed how naive they still were. 
when Joe Buck didn't recognize a joint for what it was. Mm -hmm. And that's coming as someone who has, I have never smoked a joint in my life. And with my allergies, I have a hard time going to concerts. I honestly expect if I ever did smoke one firsthand, I would be hospitalized immediately. And yet I knew what that was. So maybe it's just become a little more common somehow. But I, I'm i trying to figure out how you could live through the, the hippie movement and be less familiar with what a joint looks like than I did growing up in a conservative Canadian province. Politically speaking, I live in Alberta. We are, on the whole, this province is a lot closer to Texas than any other part of the U.S., even though I'm personally okay. quite left-wing. So I try to avoid the use of the word liberal because, well, there's nothing wrong with being liberal. It's just that one of the left-wing parties in Canada is known as the Liberal Party. That's the official name. I just use left-wing to drive home that it's, yeah, it's not that particular party. It's just that side of the spectrum. I couldn't clearly tell if the host were tr was trying to help Rico or if it was an outcast amongst outcast situation. Like, when they were suggesting that he take a shower or go lay down, I got a note of sympathy, so I couldn't tell if they were intending to be offensive or not. Yeah, I didn't get a lot of sympathy. I got more offense from most of the people at the party to, to Rico. I also found that the, the sequence was a little long, and John Schlesinger has even said, yeah, going back and looking at the, at the film, if he had to re-edit it, he would cut down the party sequence. I think some of that was the, the tribute to Andy Warhol. So the people who were associated with Warhol each had their, their few seconds of the showcase, but having the party quite that long didn't quite serve the film the way it was meant to. Well, and I wonder if it doesn't work as much for us because we're so far removed from Warhol as an idol. That could certainly be a part of it, yeah. I mean, I know who he is, but like, he's not someone where I've hunted down any of his films or anything. Yeah, agreed. I, I know it well enough that what I've seen work attributed to Andy Warhol that you can show me other Andy Warhol work and I could probably guess that it's his, but if you give me a, a decent imitator or someone inspired by Warhol, I might identify it as Warhol as well because his work was unique enough that anything sort of in that genre, I might attribute to him whether it was actually his or not. Kind of like how so many parody songs are attributed on with the, you know, the, the pirate streaming where Al Yankovic keeps having people say, oh, I love this song by yours, and it wasn't his, because any sort of parody song ends up with his name attached to it at one point or another when it's illegally shared. So, shall we run through all the winners for the year? Yep. All right, so the 42nd Annual Academy Awards Ceremony took place on April 7th, 1970 at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. The Best Picture went to Midnight Cowboy, produced by Jerome Hellman beating out Anne of the Thousand Days, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Hello Dolly, and Zed, or Z. I'm not sure how it's pronounced there. It was a, a foreign language film, and Canada and the U.S. disagree on how it would be named. It's just the letter. Best Director went to John Schlesinger for Midnight Cowboy, beating out Arthur Penn for Alice's Restaurant, George Roy Hill for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Sidney Pollock for They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, and Costa Gavras for Zed. Best Actor went to John Wayne for True Grit as Rooster Coburn, beating out Richard Burton as Henry VIII in Anne of a Thousand Days, Dustin Hoffman for his role here in Midnight Cowboy, Peter O'Toole in Goodbye Mr. Chips, and John Voight from Midnight Cowboy. So both of our leads were nominated. Best Actress went to Maggie Smith for The Prime of Miss Jean Brody as the title character. Jean-Vierre Bujold was nominated for Anne of a Thousand Days as Anne Boleyn. This was years before she would be cast as Catherine Janeway for three days of shooting in the Voyager pilot before they parted ways. Jane Fonda was nominated for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Liza Minnelli for The Sterile Cuckoo and Gene Simmons for The Happy Ending. Best Supporting Actor went to Gig Young for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Beating out Rupert Cross 
for the Reavers, Elliot Gould for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Jack Nicholson for Easy Rider, and Anthony Quayle for Anne of a Thousand Days. Best Supporting Actress went to Goldie Hawn for Cactus Flower, beating out Catherine Burns for Last Summer, Diane Cannon for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Sylvia Miles for Midnight Cowboy as Cass, and Susanna York for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? as Alice LeBlanc. Best Story and Screenplay Based on Material Not Previously Published or Produced went to William Goldman's screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, beating out Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, The Damned, Easy Rider, and The Wild Bunch. Best Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium went to Waldo Salt's adaptation of James Leo Hurley's Midnight Cowboy, beating out Anne of a Thousand Days, Goodbye Columbus, They Shoot Horses, Don't They, and Zed. The best documentary feature went to Arthur Rubenstein, The Love of Life, beating out Before the Mountain Was Moved, In the Year of the Pig, Olympiada on Mexico, and The Wolfmen. Best documentary short subject went to Czechoslovakia 1968, beating out An Impression of John Steinbeck writer, Jenny is a Good Thing, Leo Bormann, and The Magic Machines. Best live action short subject went to The Magic Machines, beating out Blake and People Soup. Best short subject cartoons went to It's Tough to Be a Bird, beating out Of Men and Demons and Walking. Best original score for a motion picture, not a musical, went to Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, beating out Anne of the Thousand Days, The Reavers, The Secrets of Santa Vittoria, and The Wild Bunch. Best score of a musical picture, original or adaptation, went to Hello, Dolly, beating out Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Paint Your Wagon, Sweet Charity, and They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Best Song Original for the Picture went to Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, beating out Come Saturday Morning from the Sterile Cuckoo, Jean from the Prime of Miss Jean Brody, the title song from True Grit, and What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life from The Happy Ending. Best Sound went to Hello Dolly, beating out Anna the Thousand Days, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Gaily Gaily and Marooned. Best Foreign Language Film went to Zed, which came out of Algeria, beating out Adeline 31, Battle of Neretva from Yugoslavia, Adeline 31 was from Sweden, The Brothers Karamazov from the Soviet Union, and Mind Aid at Mods from France. Best Costume Design went to Anne of a Thousand Days, beating out Gaily Gaily, Hello Dolly, Sweet Charity, and They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Best Art Direction went to Hello Dolly. Beating out Anne of the Thousand Days, Gaily Gaily, Sweet Charity, and They Shoot Horses, Don't They? That sounds familiar. Identical nominations to costume design. Uh, Best Cinematography went to Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, beating out Anne of the Thousand Days, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Hello Dolly, and Marooned. Best Film Editing went to Zed, beating out Hello Dolly, Midnight Cowboy, The Secret of Santa Vittoria, and They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And Best Special Visual Effects went to Marooned, beating out Krakatoa, East of Java. So the multiple nominees, there were 10 nominations for Anne of the Thousand Days, 9 for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? 7 each for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Hello Dolly and Midnight Cowboy, 5 for Zed, 4 for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, 3 for Gaily Gaily, Marooned and Sweet Charity, 2 each for Easy Rider, Goodbye Mr. Chips, The Happy Ending, The Magic Machines, The Prime of Miss Jean Broody, The Reavers, The Secrets of Santa Victoria, The Sterile Cuckoo, True Grit, and The Wild Bunch. But for the multiple wins, there were four each for, or four for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, three each for Hello Dolly and Midnight Cowboy, and two for Zed. So, anyway, that is our nomination and winner list. If there were any of the special awards, like the Irving G. Thalberg Award, as there typically are, they are not listed on this Wikipedia page. So before we dig into it, do you have any general thoughts on the winners? Just, I need to watch Anne of a Thousand Days now. I, you know, I peek at the Best Picture nominees, but I don't really interrogate the different uh, categories until we record. So, you know, not saying that it hasn't happened before, but the film was obviously really highly thought of to get nominated in like 10 different categories, but then not to win in any of them. That, that's that got to make for an interesting picture. Yeah. it. I almost wonder if we go through and look for... Well, actually, it did win Best Costume Design, looking at it, because it's going to look for 
see if there's some trivia about you know oh, the okay. most nominations with no wins. And yeah, but so it didn't win. It only won the ones, which is why I didn't list it at the end for the multiple awards. Got it. But yeah, it did get best costume design. But I wonder somewhere out there, there's got to be an Oscars trivia page that would say which film had the most nominations with no wins. But yeah, winning 10% of the nominations has got to be a pretty low percentage. At least that's probably as low as a non-zero win would get. Well, it got nominated in almost every category it was eligible for, as you kind of go through, or a good deal of them at least. You know, it didn't get nominated for Best director, best supporting actress, but it had a nomination in most of the majors. And then most of the artistic categories it was nominated in, you know, score, costume, etc. So Yeah, um scrolling through it here, I I think you are correct that best director oh best director and best editing seem like the two eligible categories that it did not get nominated for. So yeah, that I would agree that suddenly seems more appealing. Also because, to me, Jean-Vierre Bujold is only the name of the first woman cast as Catherine Janeway that had the production crew so excited because she's an incredible actress, but she had a hard time finding the character and was not prepared to work on the TV shooting schedules. And they just talk about TV shooting schedules. Star Trek is notorious for having brutal shooting schedules. I mean, there, Wallace Shawn has said, it, it was so exhausting. He is still embarrassed, but there's an episode of Deep Space Nine where he played the Grand Nagus. It was so long and so tiring with the hot lamps under the heavy makeup. It's the only time in history he actually fell asleep while the cameras were rolling. Because the character he's playing was supposed to fall asleep. Because, you know, it was supposed to be old, you know, not doing well health-wise and fall asleep in the middle of holding session, and the actual actor really did fall asleep in the middle of filming. And that's the take that they used. But Star Trek is notorious for having 16- and 17-hour days, and directors getting a script three days before they're supposed to start filming. They plan their pre-production and show up on the first day of filming and say, oh, by the way, here's the new script. It's a page one rewrite. So as much as I like the finished product, it sounds like it would be pretty miserable to work on most of the classic Star Trek. It does seem like from Discovery Forward they have corrected a lot of that. Yeah, so not not wanting to deal with Star Trek shooting schedules should not be considered a slight against Bujold on that one. No. It, you know, I guess starting with Best Picture, I've only seen two of the nominees. I, I've seen Midnight Cowboy and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I've seen clips of Hello, Dolly, but I haven't sat down and watched the entire musical yet. Okay. Uh, those are actually the three I have seen. So I have not seen Zed or the Anna of the Thousand Days. So what were your thoughts if you were to pick amongst those two? I don't know. You know, um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, a more enjoyable film for me. It's more within my comfort zone midnight cowboy i think had the stronger performances i don't necessarily feel like one was better directed um than the other or better put together than the other so i guess i'll still give it by a nose to midnight cowboy yeah that is fair of the three i've seen i would agree that it's between those two it would be either Butch and Sundance or Midnight Cowboy. I I would say, okay, in my mind, I sometimes separate film and movies, where a film is something that's trying to push the language of the genre and trying to tell stories in in ways that we haven't done it before and trying to put the craft above the pure entertainment value, whereas a movie is more focused on the entertainment value than innovation, and it can do both, but if it has to make the choice, the movie will choose the more entertaining, while a film will choose the more innovative. So 2001 is one of my favorite films of all time, but 2010, The Year We Make Contact, is a better movie in that context, 
speaking again about Balaban, who was mm-hmm. in 2010 as well. And to me, that's where the division comes here. I would say that Midnight Cowboy is the better film, but Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is the better movie. It is more entertaining. Butch and Sundance could have been made five years earlier under the Hayes Code with different people. You could take that identical script and make it with the Hayes Code, you know, maybe tweaking a little bit as they often did with the the woman's job during the Westerns, because there was a lot of coding for prostitutes and not saying prostitutes in the classic Westerns. Mm-hmm. Whereas Midnight Cowboy, you couldn't code it and not break the entire film. That's what it is about on every level. So I think if I were to to pick my preference now, I would probably say Butch and Sundance. And that actually is saying a lot from someone who doesn't particularly care for Westerns. The Westerns I've enjoyed, I can count on one hand with fingers left over, and Butch and Sundance is on that list. But if I were voting in 1969, I might have gone for Midnight Cowboy because of how different that experience was compared to the films that were previously made available. It did break a lot more new ground than Butch and Sundance did. Butch and Sundance just did what had already been done, but did it very, very well. Yep, yeah, but Midnight Cowboy dared to be ugly and uncomfortable at a time when that wasn't usual. Whereas Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was more the traditional... Uh, <laughs> you have Newman and Redford, so you have kind of the <laughs> handsome uh, male leads of the time together just... O- you know, it'd be like doing a film with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, or like the Clooney and Pitt Ocean Eleven movies, where everybody's just oozing charm. And I, I, I think you put it perfectly. Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid's a better popcorn movie, but Midnight Cowboy probably progressed the uh, the art and the industry more than Butch Cassidy and Sundance did. Mm-hmm. And I admit I might have a soft spot for Butch and Sundance because that's what my parents saw on their first date. So, you know, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head was their song until we lost my dad about two years ago. He lost his fight to cancer. But So shall we go through the Golden Globes? Before we do, real quick, I, I just want to talk about the kind of, a couple of the other main ones. Best Actor. I, I think... Everyone now agrees that John Wayne was more for recognizing a body of work. Though, to be fair, Rooster Cogburn did end up becoming one of his most iconic roles in a very long career. But between Hoffman and... If it was between Hoffman and Voight, who would you have given Best Actor to? Oh, that... Yeah, if I had to rank all five... Of these, I can only really rank Voight and Hoffman because I haven't seen the other films. And I would agree that based on the other stuff I saw from John Wayne, he was really good at the body language end of acting. I've never been impressed with his line delivery. So I I think that's more, oh, yeah, this guy has been a huge part of the industry for decades. He's done a lot of respectable work and he's coming to the end of the career. So let's do like a almost like a Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. But give it in the main category. This was actually right before he shot his own career in the foot with that Playboy interview where he said some unpleasant things about indigenous peoples that came back to bite him. I don't know if you saw that. The interview recently made the rounds and people were freaking out about it, but it was uh, John Suntress of Word Balloon saying, yeah, you know what? You don't have to worry about canceling John Wayne now. 1971 took care of John Wayne in 1971. That interview virtually ended his career. But of these, you know what? I, as much as Dustin Hoffman gave a performance I've never seen, I might give it to John Voight just because, like I said, that one line for Hoffman, he when his voice comes out, it feels almost like breaking character. And there are no moments from John Voight where he seemed to be breaking character. And he did have the heavier load because the whole movie rests on that part. I, I I think I'm with you. At first glance, Hoffman's performance seems more 
sophisticated, and one might think Voight is doing a bad acting job because of the way Joe Buck comes across. But I think there's less noticeable artifice with Voight's performance. And I think acting poorly is harder than people think it is in terms of an acting job. The accent, the loud intonation, the body language. I think Voight did a much better job than people. Well, I mean, obviously at the time they recognized him because he did get nominated. But today, you don't really hear anybody talk about Voight's performance. It's all Hoffman's, and I think Voight gave a much stronger performance than maybe people remember. Yeah, I think a lot of my generation know John Voight as the sort of the three things they know him from are his role in the first Mission Impossible movie, Mm -hmm. or the butt of a joke in Seinfeld where George by John Vo- or buys John Voight's car and it turns out to be the dentist and not the actor or knowing him as the father of Angelina Jolie. They don't seem to know him as much for his acting work, but if this is typical of it, cause I don't even, I don't know that I've seen much from him other than this and mission impossible. Um, he's the father in the National Treasure films. I don't know if you've seen those. Oh, yes. I saw the first one and enjoyed it. It's one of the few PG-rated action movies that you could watch with a 10-year-old and not have to worry. But looking at it, yeah, it's he's got a respectable career, but I've owned Catch-22 for years, haven't gotten around to watching it. I keep hearing that Deliverance is an incredible movie, but not easy to watch. And it's one that he's in. Runaway Train, Oh, Heat, I would have seen him in. He was Nate in that from 1995. He was getting a lot of work, but yeah, The Rainmaker, Anaconda, U-Turn, Most Wanted, Enemy of the State, Baby Geniuses. Okay, I would have also seen him in Zoolander. I haven't yet seen Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, Pearl Harbor, or Ali. He was in those. Yeah, so he's got a significant career. Oh, right, he had a role in Transformers, but I won't. Hold anyone's performances in Transformers against them, because that's not the kind of director they were working for. So yeah, he definitely has an impressive resume. There's just not a lot that I have personally seen from him, but I I am willing to explore more, because he nailed it here. Awesome. That's the one I wanted to dig into a little bit, just because we had both of the leads up for the same category. Yeah, and like we said, I think the... The John Wayne thing is worth a mention as well. Now, should we move on to the 27th Annual Golden Globe Awards, just for the comparisons? Yep. So that one, the best motion picture, they split into the two categories instead of three. So drama went to Anne of the Thousand Days, beating Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Midnight Cowboy, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, and they shoot horses, don't they? So there, they went the other way. For comedy or musical... That went to The Secret of Santa Vittoria, beating out Cactus Flower, Goodbye Columbus, Hello Dolly, or Paint Your Wagon. Now, Paint Your Wagon is the one of these nominees that I have seen. That was certainly enjoyable. And I would have had no problems had that taken home comedy or musical for the Golden Globes. So, see, now I need to see The Secret of Santa Vittoria, because I've never heard of it, but if it beat out Hello Dolly and Paint Your Wagon and Cactus Flower at that, that's one that's worth investigating. Now, for uh, Best Performance in a Motion Picture Drama, actor went to John Wayne for True Grit, beating out Alan Arkin from Popeye, or Popey, I should say, uh, Richard Burton for Anna of the Thousand Days, and again, Dustin Hoffman and John Voight were both nominated. Best Actress went to Jean-Vierre Bujold for Anna of the Thousand Days, beating out Jane Fonda, Liza Minnelli, Gene Simmons, and Maggie Smith. The Best Performance in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical, actor went to Peter O'Toole in Goodbye Mr. Chips, beating out Dustin Hoffman for John and Mary, Lee Marvin for Paint Your Wagon, Steve McQueen for The Reavers, and Anthony Quinn for The Secret of Santa Vittoria. Actress had a lot of nominations. So Patty Duke won for playing Me, Natalie, or won for playing Natalie Miller in Me, Natalie. She beat out 
Ingrid Bergman for Cactus Flower, Diane Cannon for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Kim Darby for Generation, Mia Farrell for John and Mary, Shirley MacLaine for Sweet Charity, Anna Magnani for The Secret of Santa Vittoria, and Barbara Streisand for Hello, Dolly. Best Supporting Performance, where here there's one category only per gender dropping the genre distinction. Supporting Actor, Gig Young for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Same as the Oscars. Beating out Red Buttons for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Jack Nicholson for Easy Rider, Anthony Quayle for Anna the Thousand Days, and Mitch Vogel for The Reavers. Supporting Actress, Goldie Hawn for Cactus Flower. Beating out Marianne McAndrew for Hello, Dolly, Sean Phillips for Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Brenda Vaccaro for Midnight Cowboy, and Susanna York for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? So, b- before you go further, I'm just going to ask, here Brenda Vaccaro got nominated and it was Sylvia Miles for the Oscars. Which one do you think was most deserving of a Best Supporting Actress nomination? Yeah, honestly, I would go with the Brenda Vaccaro. It's... Uh-huh. It was a more significant role, for sure, but it also had more variety and depth to it, I think, than Sylvia Miles did. I I agree. Now, in our other categories, Best Director, interestingly, Anne of the Thousand Days won with Charles Jarrett, which is one of the two films in which it was not nominated for the Oscars, beating out Gene Kelly for Hello, Dolly, Stanley Kramer for The Secret of Santa Vittorio, Sidney Pollock for They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, and John Schlesinger for Midnight Cowboy. Best Screenplay went to Anne of the Thousand Days for Bridget Boland, John Hale, and Richard Sokolov, beating out Butch Casting the Sundance Kid, If It's Tuesday, This Must Be Belgium, John and Mary, and Midnight Cowboy. Best Original Score, Butch Casting the Sundance Kid, beat out Anne of the Thousand Days, Goodbye Mr. Chips, The Happy Ending, and The Secret of Santa Vittoria. Best Original Song, Gene from the Prime of Miss Gene Brody beat out Goodbye Columbus, the title track. Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Stay from The Secret of Santa Vittorio. True Grit, title track. And What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life from The Happy Ending. Best Foreign Film English Language went to Oh What a Lovely War for the United Kingdom, beating out The Assassination Bureau, If, and The Italian Job, all for the United Kingdom. And Mayor Ling from France? That seems like a ringer category to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say best foreign film in the English language. It's going to be heavily biased for the United Kingdom with a little bit of Canada and Australia in it. And I do mean a little bit. I'm a Canadian. I'm proud of some of our Canadian films. But the Canadian film industry, when the National Film Board of Canada was being formed, and Norman McLaren was in charge, he decided to emphasize development of documentaries and animation, because the U.S. wasn't really doing that. So we've never attempted to, for a long time, we were not attempting to compete with U.S. product for the, the fiction categories that tend to do really well in the awards. Best Foreign Film in a Foreign Language, Zed from Algeria, again took the top award, beating out Adeline 31 from Sweden. The Big Dig from Israel, Fellini Satyricon from Italy, and Girls in the Sun from Greece. New Star of the Year actor, that went to John Voigt from Midnight Cowboy. Hmm. Beating out Helen Berger from The Damned, Glenn Campbell from True Grit, Michael Douglas from Hail Hero, and George Lazenby from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. We've heard of some of those. George Lazenby, I admit, I know only from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. But for New Star of the Year actor, yeah, I think John Voight and Michael Douglas have both had some longevity. Yep. New Star of the Year actress, Ali McGraw from Goodbye Columbus took that one home, beating out Diane Cannon for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Goldie Hawn for Cactus Flower, Marianne McAndrew for Hello Dolly, and Brenda Vaccaro for Where It's At. Which is interesting that Where It's At is what gets Brenda Vaccaro the nod. But yeah, Vaccaro, Diane Cannon, and Goldie Hawn are the three there that have really kept working. The Cecil B. DeMille Award went to Joan Crawford. And in their television categories, Best Actor in a Drama Series went to Mike Connors for Mannix, beating out Peter Graves for Mission Impossible, Lloyd Haynes for Room 222, Robert Wagner for It Takes a Thief, and Robert Young for Marcus Welby, MD. Best Actress in a Drama went to Linda Crystal 
for the High Chaparral, beating out Amanda Blake for Gunsmoke, Peggy Lipton for the Mon Squad, Denise Nicholas for Room 222, and Eleanor Parker for Bracken's World. Best Actor in a Comedy or Musical Series went to Dan Daly for The Governor and JJ, beating out Tom Jones for This is Tom Jones, Jim Neighbors for The Jim Neighbors Hour, Dean Martin for The Dean Martin Show, and Glenn Campbell for The Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. So that Don Daly is the only one who won from a show not named after him. <laughs> and then Best Actress in a Comedy and Musical Series went to Carol Burnett for The Carol Burnett Show, tied with Julie Summers for The Governor and J.J., beating out Lucille Ball from Here's Lucy, Diane Carroll from Julia, Barbara Eden from I Dream of Jeannie, and Debbie Reynolds from The Debbie Reynolds Show. So my takeaway from the Golden Globes is The Governor and J.J. was a comedy series that existed. It says it showed in the U.S. and Canada, 69 to 1970. Yeah, September 69 to December 1970. And Canada ran it on CBC because it was 1970, so that was probably our only network. I don't know how old CTV is. But anything there that stand out for you we haven't already mentioned? I don't think so. I did a quick look at Marianne, Marianne McAndrew. She did about three films in, or four films in the early 70s. Evidently made a really bad horror movie with um, her husband. And then did TV for the rest of her career, but the Wikipedia page does, didn't really expand on her TV credits at all. It just included her filmography, so. Okay. So, who would we recommend Midnight Cowboy to? I'm not educated enough to put a good name on the style or movement or genre that it belongs to, but... If you are interested in films of the 70s and how the films changed during the 70s, even though this is 69, you know, the a decade is typically kind of starts culturally a year or two before and ends a year or two after. They don't, you know, end perfectly on the calendar. You know, I think this is a good film. Like, if you're interested in kind of the New York counterculture scene. Um, this kind of, there's, I think, a Venn diagram there to where people may find it, to where people may find it interesting. I mean, they're completely different types of films, but, you know, I think this is of a piece with films like Death Wish, for example, that or The Warriors that show New York from a certain period in a certain light. I, I think you could kind of put together a neat film festival that way. Okay. But yeah, I would agree. This is one... It is a character piece, so it's hard to really say, oh, you know what, this is something that you really need to watch. Um, unless you're looking at that character specifically. Yeah, it's one you may pick up if you're trying to follow an actor's body of work. Other than drama, which is, to me, too broad of... Uh, genre heading you know I, I can't really say like watch this if you like westerns or watch this if you like action films or something like that if you like dramas or comedies about unconventional relationships I think you'd enjoy this film uh, again they're not the same type of movie exactly but I could make a through line between this and Harold and Maude as an example. I could see that. All right. Now I just realized we are doing things a little bit out of order here, at least out of our normal order. Uh, but we haven't uh, yet discussed how this is held up over time, looking at the Letterboxd and IMDb voters. So looking at our five nominated films on the IMDb for Best Picture, the highest rated film is Zed from Algiers. Hmm. So that came in at number five for the year, with the description, the public murder of a prominent politician and doctor amid a violent demonstration is covered up by military and government officials. A tenacious magistrate is determined not to let them get away with it. So that does sound very promising. The second highest on the IMDb is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That came in at number 10 for the year. Uh, they Shoot Horses, Don't They is number 17. 
Midnight Cowboy is number 18, and Hello Dolly is number 71. So a little bit of a gap there. Now, looking at it on Letterboxd, Zed is the fourth highest rated movie of the year. So again, it's the best of the nominees, followed by They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And then Butch Casting the Sundance Kid. And finally, Midnight Cowboy comes in. Midnight Cowboy is coming in at number 22 for the entire year. Now, I'm not sure where Hello Dolly comes in, because I've just got the top 72 results here, and it's not on that page. Is Easy Rider in the top 10 on either of those? That's the other big kind of cultural touchpoint film that came out this year that was on some of the nominations. Yeah, I'm just looking. Unfortunately, for some of them, if you can't read the film title right off the poster, because they've got the poster thumbnails, so it can be a little hard on the IMDb to find it. On Letterboxd, sorry. Okay, so Easy Rider would be just on the second page of results, because the first page of results ends with an average rating of 3.73, and Easy Rider averages 3.66 out of 5 okay. on Letterboxd. It comes in at number 49 on the Internet Movie Database. Okay. So I would say the other major American film that has done well on both of the rating scales that wasn't mentioned would probably be The Wild Bunch by Sam Peckinpah. That's number 13 on the IMDb. So it's coming in above most of the nominees. It's only behind Butch and Sundance and Zed. Looking for it on the Letterboxd ratings, it comes in a couple spots below Midnight Cowboy, so it comes in at number 24 there. Okay. So yeah, I would say that would be the other film that seems like it should have been part of the conversation from the year. And then, again, the Letterboxd, we've discussed it before, but the seventh highest rated of the year is Doctor Who The War Games, so the final Patrick Troughton story in its movie edit, which would be long since that was a 10-parter, but I don't know that I would rate it higher than Butch and Sundance or Midnight Cowboy. It was good, but the production budgets and timescales available to Doctor Who at that time make it difficult for me to put any of them really high. Certainly enjoyable, but they wouldn't compare to any of the Best Picture nominees in general. I don't know. It's got, uh, any Doctor Who serial that has Philip Maydock as a villain gets like an instant 10-point jump. Yeah, I'm just getting back through. I think the only thing the Wild Bunch got nominated for was uh, Adapted Screenplay Original and Score. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of scanning through real quick, so I may have missed something. No, I think that was it. Okay. I'm just looking at Philip Maydock's filmography here. He was in a, an adaptation of The Bourne Identity from 1988 starring Richard Chamberlain that I didn't even know existed. But yeah, apparently he is his most popular works are... There's a lot of Doctor Who I'm seeing here. Number one is Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, apparently. But then there's Daleks Invasion Earth, and as we keep going down, there's the War Games, the Brain of Mrobrius, the Power of Crawl. Anyway, so we finished slightly out of order, but we got everything covered. So shall we let people know what to expect next month? Yes, uh, next month we are going forward a year, but jumping back in time as we cover the biopic patents during George C. Scott. Yeah, which, scrolling down and looking particularly at the Best Actor category, there's some other notable things going on this year. But yeah, we will look at Patton, which was nominated against Airport, Five Easy Pieces, Love Story, and MASH. So, yeah, join us again next month when we take a look at that, and thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Please, sir. I want some more.